Thank you for joining me in this very intriguing, interesting um, talk. Uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, where I came from, why I do what I do, but um, my name is Amy Davila. I um, have been working in the art world for over 25 years. I am, uh, I started ArtSmart about 11 years ago. Um, but before that, I, um, my background is actually in business and specifically tax accounting. And what happened was I went to school, got my degree, started working in accounting, uh, working with a lot of lawyers, wasn't very interesting. So I started working in art galleries part-time and I just grew to love it so much that it became my career. And I worked my way up. I started out as a front desk person, um, worked my way up and became a director at David's Warner. So I was there for many years, um, but my main focus was kind of infrastructure and um, kind of the internal workings of the gallery. And one of the things that I loved was working with artists not putting up the shows, not selling the work, but actually teaching the artists how to understand the money that they were getting. So I definitely, um, that was something that really, it made sense to me. It was easy for me to kind of translate to artists. So when I left David's Warner, left New York, moved to LA, I knew that I wanted to start something that combined my, um, my knack for numbers and working with artists. So ArtSmart was born and we mainly focus, um, our, our whole endeavor is working with artists. We also work with art galleries. We work with art nonprofits like ICA. Um, and we're really focused on the bookkeeping, taxes, um, any, you know, if a, a nonprofit needs a 501c3 or if a business wants to become an LLC, we help with that. Um, as you guys have heard, um, there's all these uh, small business loans that the government is giving out because of COVID. So we've been helping artists um, this whole year get um, funding. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a brief background into why I do what I do, um, how it all evolved. And, um, and now we'll get into kind of the, the nitty gritty um, of bookkeeping and tax planning. Um, I'm gonna just share my screen. Can everybody see this? Hope so. Um, I'm gonna jump right into bookkeeping because it really actually informs exactly how taxes um, should be kind of organized. And this is just something for you to think about. Um, a lot of artists do their own taxes. Um, you know, a lot of artists, artists don't have resources to hire a professional. This is something you can do for sure. I'm just going to show you the, the tricks and, and things to think about. If you ever want to hire a professional bookkeeper or get a CPA, um, I have many resources for you. So you can always reach out to me. Um, we obviously are a bookkeeping company. We also do taxes for, for artists as well. Um, but this is basically going to be able to give you the ability to do it yourself um, and just kind of know more about exactly what to look for and exactly how to organize yourself so that you're not slammed and doing this last minute in April or now May. Um, we, we want you to organize yourself throughout the entire year so that you don't feel so pressured when it comes to this time of year. The other reason to be incredibly organized is that, and this is what I always tell the artists that I work with, yes, we're doing this so that you can file your taxes on time and do it well, and save some money. But the other reason to do this 
to do the bookkeeping and to stay on top of it month by month is that you can use this information to help make decisions. So it, it allows you to create a budget. It allows you to see how much you're spending in a certain area. If you have multiple mediums that you're working with, it allows you to see what each thing is costing you, what each practice is costing you, um, when you've made profit, when you broke even. Um, but it also allows you the ability to see in, into the future. So if you just got paid on an art on, on a piece and it was $10,000, how long do you have to make that last, right? So how, what do your expenses look like? What are the things that you want to do um, as far as money and as far as studio and investment? How long do you have until another chunk of money needs to come in? So bookkeeping, yes, it's for taxes, but it's also for your own personal organization and the organization of the studio for cash flow, for budgeting, and ultimately for expansion. You know, figuring out when can you make certain big purchases? When can you make um, investment choices? I need to invest in a new table. I need, I need to invest in a new piece of machinery. I need to upgrade the paint that I'm using or the materials that I'm using. How, when can I do that? If you don't know how much you're spending and what you absolutely have to make every month to survive, you can't therefore expand. So I believe wholeheartedly that knowledge is power. Knowing this information is everything. Um, and you have to know it in order to move forward and to grow. So let's get into the bookkeeping. So basically in a nutshell, what bookkeeping is, is the money coming in and the money going out, right? So we're constantly balancing these things. How much money am I making? And that money can be made from selling the art. It can be teaching. It can be a day job. Um, there's many ways in which artists make a living. The money going out is the tricky part, right? So this is where um, knowing what you're spending, what your kind of what I call your overhead so your the basic living, your rent, your utilities, your food, um, those costs that you can't you can't just not pay, you can't just live without. So these are the necessary um, monthly costs. You've got money coming in, you've got money going out, and the goal is to have a something left over every month, right? So that you can grow the studio you can travel, you can save, you can invest. Um, so those types of things like knowing, knowing the ins and the outs help you survive, right? It just, it's basic. Um, so we're gonna jump right to the chart of accounts. So this is the nuts and bolts of bookkeeping and taxes. So everything on this list is something that you should be keeping track of. Now, you can do this in a very, very simple way, or you can do it in a very um, detailed, more complex way. Um, when I start working with artists, I always ask, are you already using some kind of system to track your expenses? Some people just look at their bank statements or look at their credit card statements, and then they um, create an Excel spreadsheet and they categorize everything. Uh, some people, what we do for our clients is we use QuickBooks Online. So what it does is it's a monthly subscription. You log in, I can also log in, and it connects directly to your bank. It connects to your credit cards. It connects to PayPal, Venmo, whatever you're using. And it, it, it's pretty smart. Um, the more you use it, the smarter it becomes. Um, but, but basically the money 
comes in, you see, okay, this money is tagged to sales, or this money is tagged to teaching income, or a grant, I received a grant. So we can tag it in a certain way, same with expenses. Okay, you went to FedEx, all right, well, we know that's shipping, or you went out to eat and you took um, a collector with you. Okay, so that's business meals. Um, you had um, a cell phone bill that you had to pay. Okay, so we categorize that to utilities or telephone expense. So we can go through and actually um, categorize everything within the program. And then the next month when it sees the T-Mobile bill or the FedEx amount come through, it knows that it's shipping because last month I told it, it that it was shipping. So it, it gets smarter and smarter as you use it. And a lot of these systems are incredibly user-friendly. Um, so it doesn't take somebody that's gone to business school in order to figure it out. So a lot of this stuff, um, I just don't want you to get too intimidated by because it's actually quite user-friendly. And the whole point of this is um, to get you less afraid of doing it because um, I think a lot of artists are like, oh, I just, I, I don't wanna look at it. I, I'm just gonna hand it over to somebody else. And that's okay, but you really do need to know these things for yourself. Um, an artist walked into um, uh, the, the gallery the other day that I was working with and he was just devastated. And I could tell the look on his face. He was like, oh my God, I just had to pay my taxes. And I, I didn't have, it was like all of my money. And, you know, and I was like, oh, well, you know, do you pay quarterly taxes? Do you set aside money every month for taxes? And he, he was like, no, I, no one told me that I needed to do that. So when we're working with artists initially, what I, a, a great rule of thumb is every time you get money in, so say the gallery that you're working with, or say um, you had a group show somewhere and money came in, okay, from a sale, 25% of that does not belong to you. It actually belongs to the government. So you have to get really methodical about um, money that comes to you because some of it isn't necessarily yours to spend. Now you can spend it and you can say in December, the last payment I get from um, this, you know, this art, this artwork, I'm going to, it's all going to go to taxes. And a lot of artists do that. I mean, a lot of people do that. You know, they're like, ah, at the end of the year, I'm going to, I'm going to save all of this, um, this money, but what in, ends up happening is you end up spending it. It's the holidays, you know? So just be very careful when you get chunks of money in that you've earmarked some money for taxes. So that come April, come May, you're not just punched in the stomach and all of your savings is gone in one, in one go because you didn't, you didn't save along the way. Um, so just, that is probably the, the, the simplest advice, but it, it hits people. I mean, and I've had artists, I mean, they're in their fifties, they're in their sixties, and they still haven't learned this lesson that some of that money you get is not technically yours to spend. So let's go down this list. Um, so that you guys are familiar with what to really look out for. So, and again, some of this is gonna be very um, kind of, um, I don't know, a no brainer, but I just, I wanna just reiterate it because I think we've got a lot of people that um, in the audience that are very new to this and some people are not new to this, but I just wanna make sure we don't, um, we, we, wanna, we wanna cover all of our, our ground here. So um, forgive me if this is redundant to some people. So the first thing that you wanna think about when you're tracking expenses is how, what did it cost you to make the work itself? So your materials, your, um, and this could be canvas, paint, 
Um, if you're a video artist, it could be um, your, your hard drive, your computer, um, the cables, um, all of these things make the work. So anything that makes the work should be considered cost of goods sold. And when you're looking at your tax return at the very top, and when, when I say tax return, all artists uh, should be filing a Schedule C. And a Schedule C is actually inside the tax return. So it's about like five pages in from your tax return. Um, so your tax return is called the 1040 for individuals. And five pages in is a schedule and it's called Schedule C. And Schedule C is your business return. So it's a little mini two page business return inside your individual return. And it's gonna say your name or it's gonna say Amy Davila Studio, um, you're an artist and then it's going to say how much money did you, how much income did you make this year in 2020? You put, I made $30,000. And then after that, it's all of these things that are listed in this slide. So the first thing is cost of goods sold right after income. And this is uh, production materials, production labor, so if you paid somebody to make your work or to make part of your work, that is production contract labor. So these things go right underneath your income. So the amount of money that came into your account for art sales, and then right below that is going to be what it cost you to make the work. After that, it's all the expenses that um, were incurred to run your studio for the year. And not every single person will have all of these, but this is probably the most comprehensive list of things, and there are more. So, you know, if there's something that you're specifically questioning, you can always. Um, you know, send me an email, get in touch with me after this and say, is this technically a business expense or a deductible expense? Um, but the rule of thumb is in the operation of your studio, you incurred certain expenses. So the rule of thumb is in the operation of your studio, you incurred these expenses. Now, would something like dry cleaning be considered a studio expense? You were like, well, I went to this opening and I needed to wear this amazing outfit and I needed to have it dry cleaned. So that's technically not deductible. Um, if you um, had to have something dry cleaned and it was um, you know, something that you wore in the studio because it was something you needed to wear in order to protect your clothing um, or protect your body from, from the, um, the materials that you're using, then yes, because it is a studio expense in the operation of the studio. Um, and we can get into like kind of the nuances of what's allowed and what's not allowed. But starting at the top, so we have advertising and marketing. Not every artist is going to have this. Um, this could be your website expenses. Um, it could be any kind of, if you advertised for an exhibition, um, if a gallery advertised on your behalf, that is not cash out of your pocket. So it's not deductible for you. It's deductible for the gallery. Um, so think about it, the money left your account. So if let's say, and if, I mean, this is something that's come up in the past, um, an artist is working with a gallery and uh, they want an art format. Well, the gallery's like, sure, I'll go in and I'll split it with you. So you pay for half and I'll pay for half. So if that's something that you had to pay for out of your pocket, then yes, it is deductible to you, that portion that you actually paid. Business cards, not very many people have those anymore, but um, anything that is promotional, um, 
would go under advertising and marketing. Um, if you are, you know, paying for Facebook ads, if you're paying for Instagram ads, that is deductible. Um, auto expense. So this one comes up a lot as, you know, people are quite confused with auto expense. Is it 100%? Is it a percentage? So sometimes, um, uh, like TurboTax will say, how many miles? So there's two ways to kind of go about it. You can track your miles or you can track your expenses. So, um, and people do it all different ways and there's no one better way or anything like that. Another common question that gets asked is to lease or to buy. Um, again, it used to be that the lease was the way to go because you could deduct all of it. Well, you technically can't deduct 100% of your auto expense. Um, you can get away with about 80% unless you have a car or a truck that is 100% used for the business. So let's say you've got your, your, your regular car, but then you have like a heavy duty truck to move sculpture or, you know, to that the studio is using um, to move things around. That truck then would be 100% deductible, but your car would, and again, my rule is 80-20. So I deduct 80% for business and 20% for personal. So you can use rules of thumb like that um, with regards to auto expense. And you wanna keep track of all of it. So, you know, that's why it's so important to have some kind of spreadsheet um, or QuickBooks or something. So you're like, yep, there's my, there's my auto expenses and it's broken down, my DMV registration, my fuel, my maintenance, um, all of these things can be subcategorized out and what I do is I do 80% of that total expense, um, all my gas, all of my maintenance, um, my car washes, all of it. I, I put it in all into auto expense and 80% of that I deduct. Um, bank fees. Um, so a lot of um, any kind of bank fee. So if you're wiring money, if you have a monthly bank um, uh, you know, a fee that the bank charges you to maintain an account. All of those are deductible. Um, contract labor. Okay, so not all artists have this, but I would say that eventually most artists will. So this is an important part. Um, California, and there might be people not from California that are that are watching this, but I'm just going to speak specifically because California is kind of one of those really, really difficult states when it comes to labor. Um, it has a lot of rules. And one of the rules is you have to you have to 1099 every single person that you um, paid $600 or more to in a given year. Um, and when I say that California is difficult, I don't mean um, it in a bad way. It's just that as a, as a business owner, as a, as a sole proprietor, um, you should be aware that you have certain obligations when you hire someone. Um, so the U S the government says, if you pay somebody $600 or more, you have to 1099 them. And all the 1099 does is it alerts the government and it says, Amy Davila paid Oscar. 500 or let's say $650. Okay, so that means that I have to let the government know that that's what I did. And I put in her social security number and then they are like, okay, so Asuka at least has to report $650 of income. Otherwise we're gonna come after her. So it alerts the government that you paid someone and it's tied to a certain social security number so that they know that that person should have reported at least what you paid them. Um, what's going on with California right now is it has very specific rules about a freelancer versus an employee. So if you have an assistant that comes to your studio and works on your equipment and um, maybe they're only there two days a week, um, but they're under your supervision that means that they're technically an employee that should be on payroll. OK, 
California is going to get really strict about this and they are going to punish the business owner. So just be careful. And again, you can, you know, there's a lot of nuances to this. So this is, you know, you can email me later if you have questions about this, but um, if they are using your equipment, they're coming to your place of business, they're under your authority, be very, very careful because they might actually, under the state of California laws, they might be considered an employee, not a freelancer. So again, we can get more into the details of that, but just something to think about. That is a deduction. So regardless of if they're a freelancer, or an employee that's still deductible for the business. So you still get to write off the money that you pay people. Um, and it's a little bit more expensive to have them in as, a, as an employee, but um, it's worth it. The penalty is, is too much for, um, it's, it's, I believe the penalty is $10,000 if you get caught. So might as well just put everybody on payroll. Um, it's all deductible. Um, dues and subscription. So I always joke uh, with my artists a lot about this. They're like, is Netflix deductible? This is, how, this is my perspective. I am not a CPA. So um, this is what I do with my clients it's, and especially with artists because I believe that everything that an artist comes in contact with is um, it's inspiration. Um, it can be used as material in their artwork. And, and that's what I ultimately always kind of um, think about. When I think, could I defend it? If an auditor came to me and said, Netflix, really? Hulu? Come on. You know, for me, I'm like, yes, they are using this information and then they're turning it around and they're making an artwork from it. They also have a, a YouTube subscription and they have um, a New York Times subscription and a New Yorker subscription. And, you know, it's like all of this information is feeding into their work. Um, so that's my, that's my opinion of it is that an artist's life and all of the information and all of the kind of the outside um, influences um, directly impact the work. So I deduct those things. Um, and a, due, a dues and subscription could be anything. It could be, um, you know, a lot of times you have Adobe, Adobe stock or, you know, so software subscriptions, um, you know, any kind of subscription like a QuickBooks subscription, anything like that is deductible. Um, equipment and truck rental. Again, if you rented a U-Haul to move art, if you, um, you know, any, you know, you needed to rent a forklift, things like that. Again, rule of thumb, if it is part of the studio, um, in order to make the work, in order to run the studio, deductible. Insurance. Okay, this is another fun topic that I could literally spend a whole hour on, just insurance. Um, if you have your own studio and, the, and you rent it, please make sure you have renter's insurance. You, have, you should have at, the two insurances that you kind of can't live without are renter's and um, the commercial general liability. So renters, if you uh, rent a studio inside a larger building, if that building gets, um, say a pipe bursts in the building um, and it ruins all of your materials or uh, even worse, finished art, um, that building is not responsible. Okay, you have to have renter's insurance in order for that to be, for, um, for you to recover anything um, that you lost. The other type of insurance is general liability. So that's a commercial policy. So if you have anyone coming into your studio, you should have a commercial policy that protects you from people having accidents. Um, it protects you um, if somebody is like, uh, sues you for 
copying something or you know copyright infringement or whatever it protects the business um and and this is what i really like about general liability policy it, it almost acts like this it, it seals up the business so if somebody comes after you for something that the business did or that you did within the business they can't touch any other asset that you own so if you own a house they can't come after the house um, so again, those insurances are very cheap and they're very necessary. Uh, renter's insurance is usually like 50 bucks a month. Um, the general commercial general liability policy is around 60 bucks a month for like a $2 million um, coverage. So those are, those are mandatory in my mind. Um, the other types of insurance, some artists get art insurance and again, um, Art insurance can be expensive. So just, you know, shop around, bundle, you know, see, I have a great insurance person that I love to use. He is, is great in the sense that he will write uh, art insurance policies. He'll also write a general liability policy. He'll write a renters. So he can kind of bundle the policies and a lot of people can. Um, but be, be, be very careful not to overpay for the art insurance. Um, and that obviously protects finished pieces. Um, but again, if you're like, oh, I could remake it, you know, again, you, you don't want to overinsure yourself, but you do want to be smart about the insurance that you do get. Um, and then the other one is workers' comp. If you have people working for you, I highly recommend you get workers' comp. Again, that can, it's a very expensive insurance to get. Um, so be, be very careful and mindful when you start going down that road. But it, it is, um, you know, if you did have a, a, a major accident with um, an employee or with, um, you know, a freelancer or something like that, it, it you know, I, I've seen bad things happen. So just, uh, again, I don't want to freak you guys out or anything like that, but I think insurance is actually quite, quite important for a studio. And again, we can, if you want to um, message me after this about which insurances you're looking at, I'm happy to, to help you, guide you. Um, interest expense. If you carry a balance on a credit card and you get charged interest every month, that is deductible. Um, internet computer expense. Um, some people say, oh, if I buy a really expensive computer, I have to capitalize it, meaning you have to depreciate it. Um, they change the rules all the time. Um, I believe the current, I think if you spend under $2,500, you don't have to depreciate. You can write the whole thing off. Again, that number goes up and up every year. So, um, I can do this research and, and double check for 2020, but last year it was uh, 2,500. Um, so that means you can write the whole thing off. You don't have to depreciate it. Um, so studio stock. So if you have people coming over for studio visits and you go to the grocery store and you buy snacks or whatever, that's deductible. Um, be very careful though. And this is something when I say track this, for, for tax purposes, it's, it's important. Um, I go and I'm, you know, at the grocery store and I buy stuff for my house and then I, I'm over here and I'm buying stuff for my studio. Be very careful how you track that. Because if you, if, if an auditor ever came along and said, wait a second, you spend a lot on just studio snacks, you know, um, if you keep very careful records, you can always say, oh no, but this is, this is how I keep track of it. Um, I write on the receipt, this is for the studio. And I write on the other receipt, this is for the home. Or I have two different credit cards, one's for personal and one's for studio. If you have a way to keep track and you can show an auditor if you ever got audited, it's, it's brilliant, it's magic. Because then they just, they're like, oh great, you have a system, cool. Um, so just, it pays to go that extra mile and keep track of certain things. Now, if it's a FedEx thing and you're always FedExing for the studio or whatever, that's, you don't have to keep every single FedEx receipt, but if it's something that's a gray area, like a grocery store receipt, keep it. 
I used to have an artist client who um, used flowers in his work. And so every time he'd go to the grocery store, he would buy a lot of flowers, but he kept very careful track of this for that very reason, because he was like, well, yeah, if they looked at, you know, a Ralph's receipt, they would just think it would be for my personal, but I keep very careful records so that, you know, if I ever did get audited and also to keep track and to see like how much each work is actually costing. Um, licenses and fees. Okay. So any kind of license um, in order to operate in the state of California, you have to, um, you know, you have a, a, a fee that you have to pay. Um, they call it a tax, but it's kind of a fee um, of $800 a year. So that's deductible for, um, for the, the Schedule C return. Um, meals and entertainment. This is a controversial one. Um, it's, it's only 50% deductible. It use, and it goes back and forth whether it's deductible or not. So for me, I think to be on the safe side, what I do is I cap it. If, it's a, if I've spent $100 or more on a meal, then that means I'm usually probably doing it for promotional purposes, meaning I'm taking a client out to eat or I'm you know, entertaining staff or something like that. Again, keep careful um, records of this so that if anybody, you know, if any auditor came along and said, hey, you spent $25,000 in meals, like, so you just want to be able to say, these are the ones that I definitely entertain people, curators, um, dealers, you know, um, people in the studio. So just be careful of those. Those are kind of red flags for an auditor if that's too high. Um, medical, medical expenses, um, mileage, keeping track of our miles, but also if you have to reimburse um, somebody for their mileage. So if you have an assistant and they, um, you know, whatever drove an artwork to Malibu and back, uh, and you had to reimburse them for their mileage, that's deductible. Office expenses, this is kind of like a generic kind of dump. Um, anything like, again, office supplies, um, there's a lot of different things that we could put into that category. Um, but the, I kind of feel like that, that one is like my catch all. Um, payroll expenses, we talked about. Um, the wage that you pay someone, but also the processing fees that you pay for, um, you know, uh, if you use ADP or paychecks, there's fees involved. So that's deductible. The employer tax, that's deductible. Um, postage and delivery, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, your Professional services. So this would be if you're paying for a bookkeeper, if you're paying legal fees, if you're paying for somebody to do your tax return, all of that is deductible. Um, publications. So some artists self-publish. Um, any, if you paid a writer to do anything, that would actually fall under um, contract labor. Um, but any any printing costs. Um, design fees, again, that would be contract labor. Um, anybody that's performing a service for you is going to be contract labor. So that would be photography, um, uh, assistant work, um, design work, graphic design, anything like that is gonna fall under contract labor. Um, recruiting expenses, every time you put an ad out on like NIFA or anything like that, that's deductible. Uh, your rent. This this is so for artists that um, work out of their homes. Um, it's great to keep track of how much space you're taking up. So I have an office inside my home. So I know that that takes up 20% of my square footage. So you're going to want to do the square footage of your house or the apartment you live in, and then look at what the office or studio is taking up and take that square footage. And that's the percentage of what would be considered deductible for rent, utilities, um, repairs, things like that. So just be careful that you're consistent 
with that and that you that you actually do the work like look at the square footage and then look at the square footage of the studio or the office space so that you can actually be accurate about it um, and then if it's a, a studio that you rent and that's outside of your home then the, of course 100 percent of that is deductible um, repairs and maintenance that seems pretty self-explanatory um, research so there's cost of goods and then there's research and i like this to me is more it's not really a tax issue it's more of a personal how are you tracking um your overall expenses for making the work so i like to say if you're physically uh making the work that expense goes into cost of goods sold if you are researching new materials or new processes, um, a different way of doing something. I like to put that under research. So it's like R&D, right? Um, so again, that has nothing to do with taxes. That's if you're playing around with something in the studio with regards to materials, it's still deductible. It's just a, to me a little bit of a way for you to see well, how much did I spend just, you know, experimenting? You know, how much actually did it cost to make the work? How much did it spend, did I spend just experimenting on new things or new techniques? So I like to kind of um, split it up like that. Um, research could also be like, you know, if you go to a museum and you pay a fee to go to a museum, I, I tuck that into research. Um, security expense, shipping, uh, storage, um, supplies and catering. Again, if you throw a party or something like that, I wouldn't put it under meals and entertainment. I'd probably put that under catering. And again, when I say party, I mean, you know, maybe for the studio um, or something like that. Um, taxes and licenses. Again, I think we talked about licenses and fees, similar thing. Um, travel, again, it's a little bit like meals and entertainment. I would just be very careful of tracking business travel versus personal travel. Um, and, and, and be, you know, when I say careful, I don't mean conservative. I mean, track it. So, and this is how I, my rule of thumb is, if I have a method and if I have the due diligence to, to track everything, then I have my defense in a, in a way, you know, it's like, um, in, and again, I, I go back to an artist's life. And if you travel to Mexico City, yes, of course it was for fun too, but did you see museums? Did you visit artist studios? Did you go and see galleries? That's a work trip. Um, again, I would be very careful about documenting everything. Where did I go today? Oh, I would keep a little log of what you did and, and, and you know, make sure that it's, it, it has um, a lot of um, components that you know, an auditor would be like, well, did you go and see any clients, you know, because that's in their mind, that's how they're thinking. So I would just document what you did um, when you travel. I think that's really important. And it's a great thing to keep um, track of when you're trying to deduct as much as possible. Um, and then the last one is utilities. Again, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so overall, this is what's called the chart of accounts. And um, the thing that's most important about this is, yes, we're gonna track it for taxes and we're going to try to maximize our tax deductions, but we're also trying to track this so that we understand how much we're spending and we're under, we understand how much we're making. And we, we're trying to figure out, um, you know, this, this sweet spot of having some leftover. So, the one thing that I tell artists when we when we first start working together is separate out your personal from your business, from your studio. The easiest way to do that is um, 
is getting a checking account, getting a business checking account. It doesn't have to be a business checking account, meaning, you know, a lot of times banks charge you more for a business checking account. It just needs to be a checking account that is designated or a credit card that is designated in your mind for business use only. Again, it's a great way to easily see how much you're spending. It's a great way if you ever got audited. Um, so that's one of the first things that I advise artists to do is separate out the personal from the business. Um, and again, you know, I, I don't want to contradict myself. I do believe that artists' lives are very enmeshed, their personal and their business. But for tax purposes, we want to have um, a very clear defense as to, nope, this is, um, I, when I go to the grocery store and I buy food for myself, when I, you know, I get a juice, I use my personal, when I'm taking a client out to dinner or when I'm taking a staff member and we're celebrating her one year anniversary, you know, I'm using my business. So we want to make sure that these things are being carefully tracked. Um, and the easiest way to track them is to, is to completely separate them all together. So we have just cranked through um, chart of accounts. And I know we don't have, I think we've got 10 more minutes or not even, um, but I do wanna just, before we open it up to questions, I wanna just say one, Okay, I got a I got a question for you. Do you want to do you guys want to talk about production reimbursement or do, would you guys rather talk about PPP and the EDL? What's more important to you guys right now? Oscar, do you want to Yeah, put your answers in the chat so we can yeah. uh, we're taking an a quick poll. Yeah, because I could, so I can go into, um, I might be 50, 50, 50, you'll see. Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay. Can you do both? <laughs> yeah, I think I can do both. I think I do. Okay. okay. You have so, five minutes. Okay, <laughs> and then we have a few questions. Today. Okay, great. Okay. So production reimbursement. Okay. So this is something that I think everybody should know about. The rule of thumb in right now in the art world and has been for the last probably 10 years is that artists can get reimbursed for their production in the sense that let's say you spent, um, let's say a work of art costs $5,000. So you sell, you sell it for $5,000, okay? And you, you sell it through a gallery um, and that work costs you $1,000 to make, okay? Now, typically a gallery splits 50-50, right? Well, that, that, that's not great for the artist because they put in a thousand dollars, you know? So um, this is something to keep track of. And the reason why I bring this up in this, in this discussion is the third reason why it's important to keep track of your expenses and your production is because you can get money back from the gallery you can get half of what you spent in production as a production reimbursement when the work sells. So I just wanna say that as an aside, track everything for taxes, track everything so that you understand where the money's going. Um, but thirdly, track it so that you could potentially get a reimbursement from your gallery for any money that you put out that was directly related to the production of a particular piece. So that's just just something um, it 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 um, it incentivizes you to to do that. Um, so the last thing that I just want to bring up is the PPP. Um, sorry. So sorry. Um, I'm just going to go back. So, <clears throat> so the last thing I want to talk about is the PPP. Does that, you might not know um, who, what the PPP is. So I'm just going to give you a brief kind of summary. Um, the PPP is the Payroll Protection uh, Program. 
Last year when COVID hit, the government basically wanted to incentivize people to keep people on payroll, right? So if I'm a business owner and I have five people on payroll, instead of laying everybody off and then having all of those people file for unemployment, the government said, hey business, we're gonna give you money and you use that money to pay people so you don't you don't let them you don't furlough them you don't put them on unemployment well now it changed so a lot of artists couldn't get the ppp because a lot of artists don't have people on payroll so they changed the rule in march to where if you are a sole proprietor so all artists are sole proprietors you get money and you spend money and you have a schedule c um, and you're, you are in the business of making art. If you take that Schedule C and you look at line seven, which is your gross income, and you take that number, so everybody after this can pull out their 2019 tax return, they can go to line seven, you take that number, you divide it by 12, and you multiply it by 2.5. That is the amount of money that you will qualify for as free money from the government um, and there's PPP1 and PPP2. So again, we, we help artists do this. Um, so if you're confused by that or don't know where to go, um, send me an email or I can send a link to Asuka so that she can post it. Um, or you can just Google it. You can just say PPP application and it'll take you to the SBA website and then you can fill out an application online. All you need is your 2019 tax return and you need to go to page, the seventh page in, fifth page in, go to your schedule C and look for the line seven number. Um, so this is new, this just happened in March. Um, the deadline for this is May 31st. So you have until May 31st to get your application in. Like I said, it's it says it's a loan, but it is a grant because it is a forgivable loan. So you have to apply for forgiveness, but it's very, very easy. Um, and, and again, this is, this is money that the government is giving out to people to help them um, survive COVID. So that is what I wanted to say about that. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, Ruben, we have a few questions. So if you could look at the Q&A box, Amy, and look, uh, well, ignore the first the chat one. Chat box or the Q&A? Uh, Q&A. Okay. So one of it is, one of the questions is, what's yeah. the benefit of giving a contractor a 1099? Right, okay. So it's, there's not and really a benefit, you just have to do it. Um, so basically what you're, again, you're just telling the government, you're notifying the government that you paid um, a certain amount to someone. So you know how like, if you have like a, a, a day job somewhere, you get a W-2, right? And you pay, um, you know, it's like you get money and you pay a little bit of money to the government and it all kind of comes out of your paycheck, right? Well, that information actually goes to the government. So you get that information so you can fill out your tax return, but the government also has that information. So the 1099 is essentially the same thing. Um, it just puts the burden on the employer. So you're an artist, you've got an assistant, you pay that assistant $2,000 in 2020. So um, you have to let the government know that you paid that person $2,000. How would internet fall in these categories? So under there's um, you know an expense category called computer and internet expenses. Internet could also be considered a utility. So you could put it under utilities as well. And I'll share that chart of accounts with Asuka so she can send it to everybody. There's multiple places you can put multiple things. So just know that um, on the 10, um, on the uh, Schedule C, there's only like eight categories that they list. And then they're like, and here's this blank miscellaneous thing and you can kind of fill it in. So you could just put internet expense or computer and internet expense, or you could just put it under utilities. It, it, there's really no rule about it. 
Um, is there an amount or percentage that you need to have as income from the art business to qualify to use deductions? No. Um, there is a rule and it's called the hobby rule where they only allow you to have losses. I believe it changed. It was three years. It may have increased to five, but let's say you made $30,000 of income and you had $40,000 of expenses. So you have a $10,000 loss. The government's really only going to let you do that um, between three and five years. I think it's three. Um, so what I do for a lot of artists is I disallow certain deductions. I think it's good to show a little bit of income. So if, if, you, if you've spent, you know, if you have income of 30,000 and you spent 40, I would, I would kind of bring it right. I would disallow um, certain expenses. I like, I like to show a little income because it allows you when you really do have a loss um, that you could, you can use it because if you use up your three years of showing losses, then you, you can't use your schedule C anymore. So you want to, you want to just be smart about it. Okay. We have a couple more minutes. Um, All right, let's see. Uh, can you use your 2020 return for the PPP? I took a loss in 2019. Okay. So here's the trick about this is what's so great. Yes, you can use the 2020 but you can also use your 2019 because they're not looking at net. They are looking at gross income. So, so if, you've, if you have your 2020 and it's ready to go, then you can do that, but you can also use your 2019 gross income. Um, when do you have to file a return? Is it after I sold a certain amount and got money or? Okay, got it. So, um, when you have income, you should file a return. You should always file when you have income. Um, if you got income internationally, you still report it as income from the US. Um, you still report it on the US income tax return. Should I create an EIN or, a, so a tax, um, so an EIN, you can do that. It's literally, it's just the social security number for a, for a business. So, um, but you can also on your schedule C, you can use your, your social security number too. So either way, a lot of people do that because they don't want their social security number used, but a lot of people do. So there's no real advantage or disadvantage. It's more privacy. All right, let's take the last two questions and okay. then wrap it up. Okay, if I make money a few different ways within one studio practice. Okay, yeah, I know where that's going. Yes, so the beauty of an LLC is, or e even a sole proprietor, you can have money flowing in to one container. So, um, you know, I've got um, money that, that uh, you know, let's say I have a yoga practice and an art studio practice. The money from my yoga practice can flow into my schedule C and from my studio practice. Um, so yeah, um, are LLCs needed initially for your business? No, you do not need to set up an LLC for your business. You can be a sole proprietor for forever. There are tax advantages at a certain level of income. So after you net, net, not gross, net uh, $35,000, then it benefits you to have an LLC. Okay, the questions are rolling, but we're going to have to conclude because we did promise this to be a good lunchtime. And if you haven't eaten lunch, you got to go eat lunch. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Amy. 